The Origin of the Magic Art From Pliny the Elders, The Natural History Book 30 In the former parts of this work, I have had the occasion more than once, when the subject demanded it, to refute the impostures of the magic art, and it is now my intention to continue still further my exposure thereof. Indeed, there are few subjects on which more might be profitably said, were it only that, being, as it is, the most deceptive of all known arts, it has exercised the greatest influence in every country and in nearly every age. And no one can be surprised at the extent of its influence and authority when he reflects that by its own energies it has embraced and thoroughly amalgamated with itself the three other sciences which hold the greatest sway upon the mind of man. That it first originated in medicine, no one entertains a doubt, or that, under the plausible guise of promoting health, it insinuated itself among mankind as a higher and more holy branch of the medical art. Then, in the next place, to promises the most seductive and the most flattering, it has added all the resources of religion, a subject upon which, at the present day, man is still entirely in the dark. Last of all, to complete its universal sway, it has incorporated with itself the astrological art, there being no man who is not desirous to know his future destiny or who is not ready to believe that this knowledge may with the greatest certainty be obtained by observing the face of the heavens. The senses of men being thus enthralled by a threefold bond, the art of magic has attained an influence so mighty that at the present day, even, it holds sway throughout a great part of the world and rules the kings of kings in the east. Chapter 2 When and where the art of magic originated, by what persons was it first practiced? There is no doubt that this art originated in Persia, under Zoroaster, this being a point upon which authors are generally agreed. But whether there was only one Zoroaster, or whether in later times there was a second person of that name, is a matter which still remains undecided. Eudoxus, who has endeavored to show that of all branches of philosophy, the magic art is the most illustrious and the most beneficial, informs us that this Zoroaster existed 6,000 years before the death of Plato, an assertion in which he is supported by Aristotle. Hermippus, again, an author who has written with the greatest exactness on all particulars connected with this art, and has commented upon the two millions of verses left by Zoroaster, besides completing indexes to his several works, has left a statement that Agonikes was the name of the master from whom Zoroaster derived his doctrines, and that he lived five thousand years before the time of the Trojan War. The first thing, however, that must strike us with surprise is the fact that this art, and the traditions connected with it, should have survived for so many ages, all written commentaries thereon having perished in the meanwhile. And this, too, when there was no continuous succession of adepts, no professors of note to ensure their transmission. For how few there are, in fact, who know anything, even by hearsay, about the only professors of this art whose names have come down to us, Apsorus and Zaratus of Medea, Marmorus and Arabantificus of Babylonia, and Tarmoinidas of Assyria, men who have left not the slightest memorials of their existence. But the most surprising thing of all is that Homer should be totally silent upon this art in his account of the Trojan War, while, in his story of the wanderings of Ulysses, so much of the work should be taken up with it, that, 
we may justly conclude that the poem is based upon nothing else. If indeed we are willing to grant that this account of Proteus and of the songs of the Sirens are to be understood in this sense, and that the stories of Circe and of the summoning up of the shades below bear reference solely to the practices of sorcerers. And then, too, to come to more recent times, no one has told us how the art of sorcery reached Talmesis, a city devoted to all the services of religion, or at what period it came over and reached the matrons of Thessaly, whose name has long passed, in our part of the world, as the appellation of those who practice an art, originally introduced among themselves from foreign lands. For in the days of the Trojan War, Thessaly was still contented with such remedies as she owed to the skill of Chiron, and her only lightnings were the lightnings hurled by Mars. Indeed, for my part, I am surprised that the imputation of magical practices should have been so strongly attached to the people, once under the sway of Achilles, that Menander even, a man unrivaled for perception in literary knowledge, has entitled one of his comedies The Thessalian Matron, and has therein described the devices practiced by the females of that country in bringing down the moon from the heavens. I should have been inclined to think that Orpheus had been the first to introduce into a country so near his own certain magical superstitions based upon the practice of medicine, were it not the fact that Thrace, his native land, was, at that time, totally a stranger to the magic art. The first person, so far as I can ascertain, who wrote upon magic, and whose works are still in existence, was Osthenes, who accompanied Xerxes, the Persian king, in his expedition against Greece. It was he who first disseminated, as it were, the germs of this monstrous art and tainted therewith all parts of the world through which the Persians passed. Authors who have made diligent inquiries into this subject make mention of a second Zoroaster, a native of Proconesus, as living a little before the time of Osthenes. That it was this same Osthenes more particularly that inspired the Greeks, not with a fondness only, but a rage for the art of magic is a fact beyond all doubt. Though, at the same time, I would remark that, in the most ancient times, and indeed almost invariably, it was in this branch of science that was sought the highest point of celebrity and of literary renown. At all events, Pythagoras, we find, Empedocles, Democritus, and Plato, crossed the seas in order to attain knowledge thereof, submitting, to speak the truth, more to the evils of exile than to the mere inconveniences of travel. Returning home, it was upon the praises of this art that they expatiated. It was this that they held as one of their grandest mysteries. It was Democritus, too, who first drew attention to Apollo Beques of Coptos, to Dardanus, and to Phoenix. The works of Dardanus he sought in the tomb of that personage, and his own were composed in accordance with the doctrines there found. That these doctrines should have been received by any portion of mankind, and transmitted to us by the aid of memory, is to me surprising beyond anything I can conceive. All the particulars there found are so utterly incredible, so utterly revolting, that those even who admire Democritus in other respects are strong in their denial that these works were really written by him. Their denial, however, is in vain, for it was he, beyond all doubt, who had the greatest share in fascinating men's minds with these attractive chimeras. There is also a marvelous coincidence in the fact that the two arts, medicine, I mean, and magic, were developed simultaneously. 
Medicine by the Writings of Hippocrates, and Magic by the Works of Democritus, around the period of the Peloponnesian War, which was waged in Greece in the year of the city of Rome, 300. There is another sect also of adepts in the magic art, who derived their origin from Moses, Yanis, and Lotapia, Jews by birth, but many thousand years posterior to Zoroaster. And as much more recent, again, is the branch of magic cultivated in Cyprus. In the time, too, of Alexander the Great, this profession received no small accession to its credit from the influence of a second Osthenes, who had the honor of accompanying that prince in his expeditions, and who evidently, beyond all doubt, traveled over every part of the world. Chapter 3 Whether Magic Was Ever Practiced in Italy At What Period The Senate First Forbade Human Sacrifices It is clear that there are early traces still existing of the introduction of magic into Italy, in our laws of the Twelve Tables, for instance, besides other convincing proofs, which I have already noticed in a preceding book. At last, in the year of the city, 657, Gnaeus Cornelius Lentulus and Publius Licinius Crassus being consuls, a decree forbidding human sacrifices was passed by the Senate, from which period the celebration of these horrid rites ceased in public, and for some time, altogether. Chapter 4 The Druids of the Gallic Provinces The Gallic provinces, too, were pervaded by the magic art, and that even down to a period within memory, for it was the emperor Tiberius that put down their druids and all that tribe of wizards and physicians. But why make further mention of these prohibitions with reference to an art which has now crossed the very ocean even and has penetrated to the void recesses of nature? At the present day, struck with fascination, Britannia still cultivates this art, and that, with ceremonials so august, that she might almost seem to have been the first to communicate them to the people of Persia. To such a degree are nations throughout the whole world, totally different as they are and quite unknown to one another, in accord upon this one point. Such being the fact, then, we cannot too highly appreciate the obligation that is due to the Roman people for having put an end to those monstrous rites, in accordance with which to murder a man was to do an act of the greatest devoutness, and to eat his flesh was to secure the highest blessings of health. Chapter 5 The Various Branches of Magic According to what Osthenes tells us, there are numerous sorts of magic. It is practiced with water, for instance with balls, by the aid of the air, of the stars, of lamps, basins, hatchets, and numerous other appliances, means by which it engages to grant a foreknowledge of things to come, as well as converse with ghosts and spirits of the dead. All these practices, however, have been proven by the Emperor Nero in our own day to be so many false and chimerical illusions entertaining, as he did, a passion for the magic art, unsurpassed even by his enthusiastic love for the music of the lyre and for the songs of tragedy. So strangely did his elevation to the highest point of human fortune act upon the deep-seated vices of his mind. It was his leading desire to command the gods of heaven, and no aspiration could he conceive more noble than this. Never did a person lavish more favors upon any one of the arts, and for the attainment of this, his favorite object, nothing was wanting to him. Neither riches, 
nor power, nor aptitude at learning and what not besides, at the expense of a suffering world. It is a boundless and indubitable proof, I say, of the utter falsity of this art, that such a man as Nero abandoned it, and would to heaven that he had consulted the shades below, and any other spirits as well, in order to be certified in his suspicions, rather than commissioned the denizens of stews and brothels to make those inquisitions of his, with reference to the objects of his jealousy. For assuredly, there can be no superstition, however barbarous and ferocious the rites which it sanctions, that is not more tolerant than the imaginations which he conceived, and owing to which, by a series of blood-stained crimes, our abodes were peopled with ghosts. Chapter 6 The Subterfuges Practiced by the Magicians the magicians, too, have certain modes of evasion, as, for instance, that the gods will not obey or even appear to persons who have freckles upon the skin. Was this perchance the obstacle in Nero's way? As for his limbs, there was nothing deficient in them, and then, besides, he was at liberty to make choice of the days prescribed by the magic ritual. It was an easy thing for him to make choice of sheep whose color was no other than perfectly black, and as to sacrificing human beings, there was nothing in the world that gave him greater pleasure. The Magian Tiridates was at his court, having repaired thither, in token of our triumph over Armenia, accompanied by a train which cost dear to the provinces through which it passed for the fact was that he was unwilling to travel by water, it being a maxim with the adepts in this art that it is improper to spit into the sea or to profane that element by any other of the evacuations that are inseparable from the infirmities of human nature. He brought with him, too, several other magi, and went so far as to initiate the emperor into the repasts of the craft, and yet the prince, for all he had bestowed a kingdom upon the stranger, found himself unable to receive at his hands, in return, this art. We may rest fully persuaded, then, that magic is a thing detestable in itself. Frivolous and lying as it is, it still bears, however, some shadow of truth upon it, though reflected in reality by the practices of those who study the arts of secret poisoning, and not the pursuits of magic. Let any one picture to himself the lies of the magicians of former days, when he learns what has been stated by the grammarian Appian, a person whom I remember seeing myself when I was young. He tells us that the plant Cynocephalia, known in Egypt as Osiritis, is useful for divination, and is a preservative among all the malpractices of magic, but that if a person takes it out of the ground entire, he will die on the spot. He asserts also that he himself had raised the spirits of the dead in order to make inquiry of Homer in reference to his native country and his parents, but he does not dare, he tells us, to disclose the answer he received. End of The Origin of the Magic Art From Pliny the Elders, The Natural History Book 30 Read by Dan Attrell If you would like to support more work such as this, please visit patreon.com slash themodernhermeticist And above all, thank you for listening.